Sometimes they'll actually be labeled. So this one is running. That's the audio. Okay. I want to actually grab this one. So that will correspond to the front panel here, which is going to be your USB ports. Um, one of these USB ports. There you go. That's, that's the one. This is actually this one that's actually around. It doesn't do the label. Right now. This is the power button. Which is which? Um, usually, see if there's a label on. That's a power. So that's USB. So that's front panel USB. The processor fan. And this one's on nice. You take your case fan, I'll be right. No, it's all right. Did you guys find the one that's on the panel? Oh, I can actually use the USB. Okay, excellent. Excellent. This right. one doesn't actually have any. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So did everyone did everyone find those connections? Okay. See, once once we turn on loose, there. Uh, basically, if you buy a case um, brand new, you're going to want to remove, first of all, open it up. Usually, it just has like a hinge or a, a sliding door that just removes a panel. Um, you're going to want to remove the old I.O. panel, the input-output panel. And to do that, um, you can just punch it out because a new one will come with your motherboard. Um, and then sometimes they'll have you install motherboard spacers, um, which actually raise the motherboard up off of the case so that it doesn't short out. Um, I've left the motherboard intact because I don't want you guys to have to like screw a bunch of screws in, so just to save some time. Um, so now we can talk about the, the motherboard, also known as the MOBO. Um, the biggest things that you want to take into account are the uh, CPU types that the motherboard supports. So if you guys actually uh, look, um, that's known as the, the socket. If you look around um, this region right here, you should see uh, what's called the socket, and you can actually read the socket type off of the computer. So right here, and there, and then yeah, you see it. What is that? PGA. This is the socket. Also, also. Did you guys find it? Yeah. Okay. What, what kind of socket do you have? PGA so four eight. So which PGA? What do you got? Four seven. Four seven. All right. Thank you for socket type. And basically the socket type is going to determine what kind of processors your computer can support. Um, the same thing goes for RAM, so you can identify the RAM slots, which are actually right here. Um, let me skip a slide because it will just trying to put stuff on the board. You can see right here the, uh, the RAM slots are going to be those, uh, those long um, right here. And you want to make sure that your motherboard is going to support the right kind of RAM. So if you want DDR3, um, which is a type of memory, we'll talk about that later, make sure that your motherboard supports it. Um, also, the form factor of the motherboard is important. We talked about this earlier. When you buy a case, you want to make sure it fits. Um, the main form factors, which are the sizes, the dimensions of the motherboard, um, that you'll see on the market are micro ATX, which is slightly smaller, and ATX, which is your standard uh, motherboard size. Um, some motherboards will come with built-in um, network, network cards, so you can plug your Ethernet directly in. You won't have to have a separate card for that. Um, actually, most modern motherboards all have that. Um, the same goes for sound and sometimes even video. So you won't have to have uh, a separate card or a, discre a discrete card to uh, to have that functionality. Um, so here's a, a label diagram of all the connections. Um, the main ones we talked about are going to be the socket, um, which is where the CPU, the central processing unit goes, um, and then the RAM slots. So those are the ones that we talked about now. So what I want you guys to do right now is to uh, connect the power to the motherboard. Um, that will involve you grabbing the, uh, the power cables that are coming out of the power supply and plugging in both the 24-pin motherboard power and the 4-pin processor power. So go ahead and find, and you guys got it.
this one. So I left I left some notes on the vanilla folders. Uh, if there's anything quirky about your computer, go ahead and read that. Um, so this one is this one is weird because you actually have two processors and two power cords. And there's no four connected. Oh, I got the brick. Yeah, like that. No, no. <laughs> that, that, just make note of it. You don't have to install it. Right? <laughs> you guys get it? Yeah, as you guys probably noticed, they only go in one direction. There'll be a little latch, and you want to make sure that's engaged. Um, These are all cords. We'll talk about that when we talk about the power supply. That's the power um, another thing that you might have noticed, on the motherboard there's a lot of writing. Um, you can actually read what each uh, connection is. Sometimes they're abbreviated and it's very tiny text. But uh, most of the time it's labeled properly. So you can see something like FDD here, which stands for floppy disk drive. Or um, obviously the RAM type is labeled here. Um, the 12-volt 12, 12 ACX, which is what we just installed, that's labeled. So, question? Why is it so long? We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and when in doubt, you can always read the manual. I want to emphasize that because your motherboard is going to come with a, a manual, and it's going to have um, all the information that you need. So, what goes where, um, what kind of stuff is supported, um, it's good to have around. Don't throw that away. Um, the next thing I want you to do is go ahead and look on the back of the computer for the rear I.O. connections. Um, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this because this is what most people deal with. Um, the main things to note, um, a PS2 port that's kind of old and it's used for keyboards or mouse. Um, USB connections, obviously. Um, sometimes you'll have a FireWire port. I don't think any of these will have that. And then uh, the Ethernet port, if that's built in, like we talked about, if it has an integrated uh, network card. Um, and then you'll see uh, the sound card as well in most of these machines. And then some of them will have video, which we'll talk about later. But that's the, uh, the rear panel. Obviously, uh, the motherboards in these machines are already installed. But uh, if, you, if you hadn't had them uh, previously assembled, what you'd want to do is just uh, line up the input output panel and go ahead and lower the motherboard in into the case and just screw it down uh, where you place those washers. There should be corresponding holes in the case itself. So now we get to talk about the power supply, which you've already uh, become familiar with. This is the uh, device that's going to convert the alternating current from the wall into direct current on the power to your computer. And the biggest thing that you want to look for in a power supply is probably going to be the output, which is how much wattage it's able to produce. And that's going to range from anywhere around 300 watts to 1,000 or more. So on, on your power supplies, you can probably identify the wattage rating just by looking for a label. Um, this, one, this one is weird. You can't really see it. But, uh, 250? OK, so that's pretty low. That's an old one. Um, 160, we have a winner. Anyone can? I 170. 170. Okay, so they're all pretty pitiful. Um, <laughs> okay, Danny, how much are you going to? I have 500 right now. I'm getting 600 a night. He's getting 600 a night. <laughs> 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 um, another thing to note is I would recommend buying one that has a modular configuration, which means that you can remove the plugs that you don't want to use. Um, and that'll really free up a lot of space. You can see this one is modular. It's a lot cleaner. This one has all the cables and they're just hanging out there. Um, the other thing to consider is they have efficiency ratings. And obviously you want to look for one with a high efficiency rating. Um, that's just like reliability and quality. Um, another thing is a lot of times cases will come with a power supply. Um, you need to be careful when you're looking at those because they'll usually throw in a cheap one. Um, so you need to check for efficiency ratings and power ratings on those as well if you're going to buy one with a case. Is a question? Um, just a thing on efficiency. There are certifications for that. There's bronze, silver, uh, and all the things like uh, for 80%. 80 yeah, 80%. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, another thing is that power supplies um, are definitely prone to failure. My desktop's power supply has failed twice, and I know the ones at the desk fail all the, all the time. So you want to make sure that you get one that has a decent warranty, and that's from you know a recognized manufacturer. Yes. So if you if you don't have any idea how much uh, power you need, you can actually go onto a site like this, which is a PSU calculator, and you can plug in all the other components and it'll give you a minimum wattage rating. So that's useful to have. Um, again, the power supplies in your machines are already installed, but if you had to install one, um, you just find the, uh, corner of the, the appropriate corner of the case and just screw it in with the uh, screws that were provided with the power supply. Another thing is that some of the power supplies will have a, a voltage switch. Um, I think actually some of these will. Like this right here, you can see it's set to 115 because that's what we use in the United States. Um, and then also there'll be a uh, power switch. So when you're ready to turn on your computer, you want to make sure that's turned on. That's one of the tr main troubles you <laughs> Power supply on, that's a good thing. So the connections that are coming out of the power supply, we are already uh, familiar with the motherboard connection and also the CPU connection. And these have changed slightly over time, but uh, they're actually 24 pin and some of these are 8 pins. But the other connections that we'll look at today are going to be the 4 pin Molex connector, which is used to plug in the peripheral, um, the drives, like the hard drive and the CD ROM drive. Um, floppy connector, no one uses floppies anymore. So. The PCIe 6 pin connector, that's going to be used to power the newer video cards, but none of these machines have that, so you don't have to worry about that. And then also uh, another newer development is the uh, SATA power, power connection. So now we get to talk about the processor, also known as the CPU, the central processing unit. Um, as you probably heard, this is the brains of the computer. It does the bulk of the, uh, the computations. There are only two main brands, Intel and AMD. I personally use Intel, but you know, they're pretty much uh, they're pretty much equal. So. The big thing that you want to look for in, uh, in, in processors is going to be the speed, which is measured in gigahertz. Um, it's going to range anywhere from like 1.6 these days all the way up to like 3.4 gigahertz. Um, I think is the highest that I've seen. And then also the number of cores, uh, which refers to manufacturers actually placing uh, multiple processors within a single processor. Um, and that helps you run applications simultaneously. Um, so that's a good thing. Dual core, quad core, even hexacore. So I can me if I'm wrong, but isn't it more important to pay attention to the number of cores than the speed than the speed that because the speed refers to now each individual is. core, right? Yeah. So it's like if it says one point six gigahertz but it's a core to duo, it's two independent cores running at one point six, right? Or no? That's correct. That's so you can't just multiply it, like it doesn't even add. Right, right. Um, eventually it might, like a, as we see software developers are writing for multi-core um, support, so it can actually, a single program can actually utilize both cores or even four cores. That's kind of neat, but uh, at the moment, um, the cores themselves don't necessarily equate to performance, unless you're opening multiple things at once. Um, and then finally, the socket, which basically determines the compatibility. We already talked about that earlier. You just want to make sure that your processor is going to fit into your motherboard, and that's going to be the socket type. So now we get to uh, go ahead and install this the CPU. Um, basically, you don't have to touch it now. I'm just going to explain it um, real quick. The first thing you want to do is just, um, this is for a newer processor, actually. Um, the older ones will look like this. This is this is familiar. So what you're going to want to do is uh, find the little arrow on the corner of the processor and make sure that's lined up with the socket. Um, and then you'll see a lever um, on the socket itself. And what you want to do is pull that lever away from the socket and then up off the motherboard. And that will actually open the socket, and you'll be ready to mount the processor. So the first thing to do is open the socket. And then place the processor, make sure it's oriented the correct direction, and then we'll go ahead and close the socket. Awesome. So, did you line up the. Uh, 
Yeah, sometimes you, uh, you're in. So go ahead and close the socket once you're ready, um, just by pulling the lever back into place. And it should click. Oh, the last guy was a newer one. Okay. On the newer ones, it has a piece of metal that comes over. Do you lever? And then do you want to place the processor? Is that true? Yeah. It, it's already open. Um, is it already open? Oh, this is the triangle. Did you, you see the arrow? It's like, 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 it's <laughs> that is the biggest processor I've ever seen. That thing's a beast. <coughs> so if, if this was your own computer, you wouldn't want to handle the processor too much because you might actually bend the pens on the bottom. That's bad. Um, even the grease from your fingers can actually uh, reduce the effectiveness of the heat dissipation. So you want to touch it as, as little as possible. But, but for this exercise, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so does everyone have their processor um, installed and properly locked? Almost. See, see, this group has two processors. They got lucky. They have a, an old school tool. Cool tool. Yeah, I'm going to see this is going to What you want to do is just bring this. Yeah, does this one have? Oh, there we go. I would recommend a lot of people use one if you don't know what people are talking about. And see, yeah, you feel a drop in. Yeah. 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 You see, you see how they're locked in there, they're way more expensive. Close this one as well. Yeah. And then, yeah, you'll see it won't be. Because what determines how fast your computer runs more than anything else. Yeah. 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 Okay, so now we get to talk about thermal grease. Um, this is the stuff that you can actually apply to the top of the processor to help uh, exchange heat between the heat sink and the processor. Um, just a note. You don't want to install, you don't want to put, you know, a lot, it's not toothpaste here, right? Because um, it'll actually leak out and potentially cause a short, and that's really not good. So you want to use as little as possible and spread it very, very thin. So these computers actually came with a, a thermal grease pad, so you don't have to worry about um, doing the thermal grease. But what's going to go on top of the processor to help uh, dissipate heat is what's known as a heat sink. Um, these are like metal fixtures, either made out of aluminum or copper. Um, and they basically attach to the top of the processor. Um, so why don't we go ahead and grab the heat sinks now. And you want to just orient it in the right direction. And go ahead and lock that into place. Most of them just use little latches. Um, that one is tricky. Yeah. Mark, that one, Mark, that one doesn't actually lock into place. So that was in the notes. Just see which way it uh, makes the most sense. What you want to do is just press it down and feel locked. Not really. 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 Okay, this one is like very tricky. Yeah. And you buy the motherboard to match that socket. It uses, uh, this is what I try to tell you. <laughs> it uses two PC clamps. Yeah. So these and are the socket clamps. type is based on So these will actually go across and down. So then you'll be locked in. See, it's okay. So go ahead and try that out in one um, processor wise. Uh, if you want to plug this uh, in, fan we'll, we'll do the fan next. Right. 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 Um, so next we can talk about the fan. Um, all of these heat sinks, or most of them should have come with a fan. This one does not, unfortunately. Um, if you do have a fan, then you're going to want to plug in the fan power. 
onto the motherboard. And that's usually located somewhere uh, around the socket, and it'll be a uh, four pin connector, three or four pin connector. That's where it keeps it cool. No heat sinks, uh, or no, no fans. I get radiates the heat off of that. Does everyone have their fan uh, powered up? The fan. <laughs> things that you would Depends want to look for. Want. Obviously is the size. You want to make sure that it fits on either your heat sink or on your case, whatever you're trying to cool. Um, and then the uh, performance is measured um, in CFM, cubic feet per minute, so the higher the better. Um, but also you have to be worried about uh, the noise level because some fans are really loud. Um, there are a number of options. If you don't want to use fans, you can also do what's called liquid cooling, which involves um, pumping some form of uh, radiator fluid um, through your computer that actually uh, can be used to cool the processor and the other components. Um, some advantages of that um, is that it's much quieter. So people have also been known to uh, use liquid nitrogen if you're like an extreme overclocker, um, or even this is probably one of the coolest things. You could actually submerge your entire computer into a non-conductive liquid like mineral oil and facilitate heat exchange like that. So that's pretty extreme. <laughs> now we get to talk about memory, also known as RAM, random access memory. Um, this is what's going to do the, uh, the short-term st storage for your computer. Um, the RAM is generally cleared every time you turn your computer off, but while your computer is on, it's going to be uh, constantly processing information. Um, so you're going to want to look for something that, uh, that has the right size and speed of memory. So for example, a two gigabyte module um, running at something like 800 megahertz. So you guys can pick up the RAM modules that you have and go ahead and try to read the labels and see what kind of RAM that you have. Um, another thing that to keep, into, uh, keep in mind is the pin type and, and count. Um, so, for example, DDR2, I think that's what most of you guys will have. Do you know what this is? DDR, DDR, all right. DDR, okay, maybe it's DDR. Okay, actually today we use DDR3, that's probably the latest. Um, DDR2 is what I have in my machine, but uh, they're, they're constantly introducing new stuff. Another re reminder is just to make sure that you buy the right kind of RAM. So it'll fit into your mother thing that's holding it down. Alright, so we're ready to install the memory. What you want to do is just pick up the module, locate the notch, um, and make sure that you line that up with the notch, the slot on the computer. Um, once you have that in place, you want to just exert pressure, uh, actually a considerable amount of pressure, um, down into the motherboard today until the latch is actually clicked into place. It's really old, and I don't even know what time it is. So yeah, you got it in the right way. Awesome. Oh, do we know what this is? No, that one. It's like minimalist. More, more, I have no idea. Yeah, so we're, we're not sure. What this is. Yeah, it's just like a, a, a silicon wafer. <laughs> so yeah, you can see they're like they're good to go. You can actually like remove one with glass and stuff. The same process, just pull the latches. And then there's notches that you have. Wow. You can also practice removing it. Just to remove it, you'll just pull the white latches and it'll pop right up and you can just remove it from the bottom. <laughs> Oh, definitely. What do you run on your rig? <coughs> I have uh, four gigs of DDR2, 800. Okay. But I built that, you know, a while ago. So. I mean, like, what's what do you have on the internals for your current setup? Um, a Q6600, which is a quad-core yeah. processor. Um, I have an Asus um, Striker Extreme motherboard. I have an 8800 GTX, which is a beast of a graphics processor. Um, so we're I have OCZ memory. 
No, I mean um, on the graphics card. In the video? The video. I think it's 768. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, we'll talk about graphics in just a second. So has everyone uh, finished with the uh, memory? Good, good, good. Now we can talk about hard drives. Um, this is what's going to be used for the long-term storage to uh, hold your files and your operating system. Some things to keep in mind are the speed. This is just like memory. Again, the speed uh, for these traditional hard drives, we're actually talking about physical platters rotating at very high speeds. Um, so that'll be measured in revolutions per minute. The standard is uh, 7200, but they also come in 5400 and 10K. So, um, and then again, capacity, um, 15K as well? It's for servers usually. Okay, that's, that's pretty extreme. <laughs> <laughs> that would just like disintegrate. Um, capacity, hard drives are so cheap these days. There's no excuse not to have you know, a lot of space if you need it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> a terabyte is like 50 bucks, so go ahead and buy a terabyte, why not? Um, yeah, I mean, look on Slick Deals, I'm serious. <laughs> uh, the size, for desktops we're talking about 3.5 inch. Notebook, a notebook drive like this, for example, is going to be 2.5 inch. So, yeah. Can I interject a little warning here? Um, my MacBook, I actually got a 1 terabyte drive that was 2.5 inches. Apparently, my MacBook only fits 9.5 millimeter tall drive. So it was a 12, 12 and a half millimeter tall drive and wouldn't fit in. And they were telling me it would. And I was like, no, I don't think it's going to fit. But uh, so you do sometimes have to pay attention to the height too if you're, if you're working with like a, a smaller notebook. That's a good point. I've never had that problem. But <laughs> leave, it, leave it to Apple to you know, use a different <laughs> small. I've seen desktop drives that are bigger as well, but you that's mean, like, mostly that's older ones. Okay. Um, the connection types for the old ones, all of you guys' uh, hard drives are going to use IDE or parallel ATA. Um, the newer drives are going to use a serial ATA, SATA drives, the little LED connections, they look like this. Um, and then also solid state drives, which we'll talk about in a second. So now you guys can go ahead and uh, install the both power and data connections to your hard drive. Um, I don't think there's a place to mount the hard drive on that one. There's a mount here. Yeah, I think we, we might have lost the rails. You're going to want to plug the... Uh, it, it does plug in. Yeah, it's like a It does matter. Um, so guys, if this is your IDE cable, there'll be maybe two plugs. These are going to go to the drives. Um, this one's going to go to the motherboard. So the ones that are farther, um, staggered onto one side, so let's go to the drives. Because you can actually plug in two drives at once. And then the IDE is going to go to the bottom. It's going to go to the motherboard. Wait, so you want it closer to a... No, you had it. You had it. Where does this guy go? This guy, you had another hard drive or uh, yeah, another hard drive. <laughs> So yeah, that could just slide there. Do you want to put these two? Yeah, there's one that goes here and one that goes there. And again, you want to make sure that it has power. Um, the power is going to be the 4 pen Molex connector, which is going to come off your power supply. Oh, because I don't want the outside. Is that what they're all engaged in? No, I seriously just lay it out. This one is actually not on this computer. So, if you wanted to do that, that's the problem. You would unscrew it right here. I can give you a screw. Alright, so then the other thing you need to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll try to protect all the rules. There's a thing called slave and master. So that is referring to whether the drive is red um, as your primary or the secondary. It goes to the, the black. Uh, you, you want to make sure that it's plugged into the primary IDE. Um, the, the secondary is going to be for your CD ROM drives. For data and stuff like that. Do you guys need power? Oh, it's, there's no clearance? 
I think it's also like that. Because you'll screw it on the other side. Yeah, it'll be like that. It'll be like a really like, like crappy one. Actually, there should be screw it, but I'll just make sure you can screw it up. Yeah, it's going to be around a thousand. I would do it on the last yeah, you can only plug the IDEs um, in one direction. They'll have a little notch again. So this is master. It's really pretty foolproof. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the right way. It uses another. There's a hard drive. There's always going to be a master. You guys are uh, you're working on a special machine because actually I'll do this one up hopefully. So if everything went correct, oh, oh, you're in the test case. You guys picked the right one, right? Okay. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, <laughs> To reach all the way to the yeah. yeah, so it just has this. These are all pre-built machines, so they'll only use it as long as the cable as they need. So then they say, probably go. That's another number. Oh, you guys are now. Here's the top. So, well, this should be on the screen. Yeah, I'm just saying this. Oh, because we don't have extra screens. Yeah, those aren't for this computer, but you can go and put them in here. If they're good. Yeah, we can't resolve that one. I took the hybrid map, but now we go So then. Okay. This is a if it came out, we'll go back in. It's a lot less confusing when you're on machines because there's no floppy interactions. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Hopefully, you guys have your hard drive connected. If not, you can kind of just leave it hanging out there as long as you have the power and data connected. That's fine. I just want to mention again that the uh, newer drives are going to use something that looks like this, which are the same connected, much smaller. The red cores are the ones used that are red Also, solid state drives, this is a relatively new technology. Um, it uses the same type of storage that's in like a USB key. Um, the advantages of that, it's, it's much faster. You can read and write data at a much higher rate. And it uses a lot less, less power, so you'll see it in things like netbooks or iPods. And it's also much more reliable because there are no moving parts. Um, the disadvantages are going to be um, the write limitations. Initially, when this technology came out, you could only write a certain number of times to the drive before the actual storage began to decay. That's not really an issue anymore. The technology has progressed. Um, but it's still pretty expensive. So I talked about the old drives. You could get a terabyte for like 50 bucks. Something like this, only 64 gigabytes would cost you you know, $120, $150. Wouldn't an additional possible disadvantage be like, well, like when the hard drive breaks, say, because it's mechanical, you can like forcefully read data off of it, whereas when one of these breaks, wouldn't you just lose everything on it regardless? That's a good point. I'm not sure how much these are. Backups. I'm going to get to backup. That is, that is a good point. Because <laughs> um, it's like, it's like all needs the circuit to like, to actually maintain yeah. the data. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much success you would have with the traditional drive recovering data, unless you had access to like a serious recovery facility. So. Um, the newest newest technology um, used for smaller things like the MacBook Air that they just came out with that actually <coughs> uses like a flash kind of hard drive, and it literally looks like a piece of RAM that goes yeah. into a little slot, and that's space saving and. I think it might even be faster than a solid-state drive. So 
So that's the newest of the new technology. Um, another thing I've seen people doing is just buying a pretty low capacity solid state drive that would house their operating system and some of their basic applications. So you can access that kind of stuff really quickly. And if you want to use the, uh, the older drive to store like your movies or music, that still works fine. So that's kind of a best of both worlds scenario. Um, now we get to do the optical drive. Connecting that is pretty much the same as the hard drive. So you're going to want to do the IDE cable. Um, <laughs> Plug that in. You guys are already got it. Go ahead again. Yeah, okay. Just make sure that's plugged into the secondary IDE port on the motherboard. This would not have a solid state at all. This is too old. Solid state's probably. To be honest, I don't, I don't even recommend that you buy these drives because they're pretty much worthless. You need them to install the operating system, but after that, I mean, yeah, you can do it with a flash drive. So, I mean, don't don't go out and buy like some sort of burner unless that's what you're into. So, I'm sorry, Pat. Cheaper one. It is a there's every cheap one, and then there's good and then better on the best. So quad cores, mm -hmm. you still consider it essential? Yeah, I still consider it essential. Okay, okay. I've just been form. reprimanded by it. <laughs> <laughs> <Cool floor. laughs> <laughs> They're also days. still cheaper than, like, say, if you're in storage or something that like, you just want to put away and get all the hard drives. No, you can't, can't see it because it's hidden too, inside uh, the wafer. Like, grab a USB stick. That's that is true. Um, so, like, in this case, this one, <laughs> Who wants this is the collections? It. But in the uh, 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 four. There's like two that are hidden under the I mean, by like 50 or so that are quad core. So you guys got some extra cables going on. Yeah, this one's probably yeah. five blocks like that. This one's four stars. I don't know the specs, but it's probably five dollars. So you're the worst of it. Maybe. And this one is four. DVD, you need pretty much no I mean, well, it's better than the original one. Power. Yeah, it's power. It's like a little bit. And the same thing if you wanted to do that. That would give them the bigger one. Probably not going to be in the work in this program. No, it's not. And you would have to figure out what the working parts are, if any. Okay, the, the last component we're going to talk about is the video card. Um, the GPU, also known as the graphics processing unit. Like, like with uh, CPUs, there's only two manufacturers of the chips themselves, NVIDIA and ATI. Danny told me that ATI has recently turned into AMD, so and they were bought out. They were bought out. A year ago, they were bought out. They're still, they're still being advertised huh? as a Actually, that just changed this month. Just this month. Yeah, yeah. Being AMD now. All the new cards that are on the market yeah, today, <laughs> all the new cards are going to use something called the PCI <laughs> Express slot, the X16. These are all machines that are not going to use that. They're going to use something called the AGP slot, which is going to be um, the brown slot on your computer, on your motherboard. Um, these things are pretty much um, like a computer within a computer, so they'll have um, advertisements of speed and memory um, and other features like DirectX support, which is for, for games, SLI, which is actually uh, the process of running two simultaneous graphics cards. I wouldn't recommend that. You kind of, yeah, Crossfire is the same thing for ATI, but I don't really think that's really, like, cost effective. Um, also, pixel, pixel shaders, these are used for all uh, the gaming. Basically, the purpose is to render 3D graphics for your applications, your games, that kind of stuff. The best metric for performance that I've seen is just to look up a benchmark test. And you can go to a site like Tom's Hardware and just look up um, how these cards perform for different applications. Um, they're going to be measuring frame rates. So the higher, the better. Um, a a higher-end card is going to you know, output 60 frames per second, a lower-end card maybe only 30. So I'm just curious because this is one area that I don't know very much about. But like, do, is there a way to like tell which cards are geared towards what? So basically, what I'm saying is, some people might use a video card for gaming and it might perform like really well because of all like the shaders and whatever it has. Whereas somebody else might use a 
uh, cards for like, like video. Yeah, video. yeah, something like that. Does it? Well, I can answer that. There are two, two types of graphics cards. So there's the ones that we use for gaming, and then there's the ones that actually used for work like that. So NVIDIA has, I think, their N Fire series, which is used for uh, CAD and things like that, for very high processing stuff. Mm -hmm. so, those there's also cost like a thousand bucks. Yeah, there's a huge difference in the workstation. Sorry. Yeah, the workstations. Do um, you use one of those graphics cards? That's, those are actually bad at gaming. Yeah. It's weird. The, the best way to know is to look at the benchmarks because we'll have different types of yeah. applications. Okay. Um, I'm actually not sure. So let's go over some of the common video connections. Um, HDMI. Um, Again, not present on your machines. <laughs> actually, hold <back. coughs> I'm just going to keep saying that. Um, that actually carries both video and sound, so that's useful. You can plug it into your TV. Um, and then the older connections, like S-Video, that's for the older televisions. VGA, I don't know what it stands for. Uh, Visual graphics capture. No. Danny, do you know what it No, but I know I don't know. OK. I don't know. It's not important what it stands for. It goes, it goes to the older monitors, all right? And then DVI is going to go to the, the newer monitors, OK? Um, so what kind of ports? I think some of these will have DVI out. Um, you can check on your video card, or if you have integrated graphics, um, is that a VGA? Yeah, we have VGA. OK, you guys have VGA. You got DVI, all right. DVI is lowest power. So let's go ahead and install the video card. Um, if you were buying, if you were installing a new card, you would use the PCI E16 slot. Um, but like I said, you're going to be using the uh, older AGP slots, which are coded in brown. Guys, yeah, if you didn't have a dedicated graphics card, I removed another card, so maybe like a sound card or a network card. So go ahead and install that anyway. Um, just so you get a feel for installing an expansion card. You put it in your network. You look so sad. You look so sad. It's all good. It's all good. This part has to remain. And then from there, you just put it in. You good? You good? Probably something you're supposed to do with this first. Yeah, so I, I try to make a note of this, but you actually have to pull this back. Let's see the card. It looks like you had a pretty good one. Yeah, there it is. And then this, this comes back down. Uh, this you have to do with an iris here. Remember the power on that one. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we can move on to the other components that you'll need, such as the mouse, the keyboard, and the monitor. Those are the basic essentials. Some other stuff that I would recommend that you buy, um, some form of removable storage, like an external hard drive, that can be used to do the all important backup. So save your data. Buy a surge protector, just so that you don't fry your equipment. Um, most of these desktop motherboards are not going to come with a wireless card, so if you want to you know, access a wireless network, you'll have to buy a separate card for that. Some people also buy sound cards. Um, sound is almost always integrated, but if you're a real audiophile, you might want to buy. Um, if you have like a home theater system, you might want to buy a sound card. How do you deal with that like in the operating system? Do you just like set it up to use the one that's that you install? You would have to install the drivers that come with. Uh, and then like it would you would select the other one. So yeah, it'll it'll run actually like an audio program in the taskbar, and that'll. Ah, be, okay. Um, search protecting, I just thought I'd bring up uh, like UPSs, um, the important thing. Yeah, if you want to invest in UPS, um, that will continue uh, to provide power for a certain amount of time so that you can shut down your computer properly. In the case of an outage, that's really useful to have. Um, those will run you a little bit more. You can probably get a search protector for like 10 bucks. Okay. Um, if you've assembled everything, you reach what's called the moment of truth, right? Um, <laughs> you want to basically plug in the power supply to the wall, um, plug in all your peripherals, and go ahead and press the power button across your fingers, right? 
Um, actually, today we're going to experience the moment of truth on this this machine right here, which I've tested. I've tested it was working before. So if they've assembled, no pressure. But if they if they've assembled everything correctly, then it should be okay. Um, so I have I have a keyboard right here. Go ahead and take that. Look at it. I got a power right here. And then we'll swap out the uh, we'll swap out the video. I think it was turned on. He's a full Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh well. There's still there's water. It's not too impressive. Ta-da! We have we have ignition. <laughs> Um, awesome. So what you're going to want to do, this is this is what you'll see. Obviously, there's nothing on the hard drive. Um, <laughs> seat failure. Just try to see that. That's fine. Um, that's because the floppy drive isn't connected, I'm pretty sure. Um, you're going to want to enter what's called BIOS. Oh, this is booting XP. Let me, let me hit that again. If you had a brand new computer, there should be nothing on the hard drive. So hit that to all startup. So some of you might have been wondering, um, there's little batteries on all the motherboards that are circular. Um, they look kind of like a watch battery. And basically what that's doing is storing settings that you'll find in the BIOS, which is what we're about to go into. We'll try this one more time. I have slides on the BIOS anyway, so if this doesn't move, we may have to move on. Hit up to it again. No, it should actually, I, I did this before though, it should be the best. Yes, I have to be one standard. Yeah. Alright, so this is what a, a basic BIOS looks like. Here it's like an onboard set of instructions. Um, very very basic level. Um, you can customize all sorts of things. It's going to depend on what motherboard you purchase. Um, but you can change things like the boot sequence, which is uh, obviously what device it uses to start up. If you wanted to install an operating system, you choose the CD drive. Um, some more uh, um, advanced BIOS will actually have options to change like the, the power, the voltage to either your processor or your RAM, things like that. So you can do what's called overclocking. I'm not really going to go into that because that's more advanced. Um, but that's BIOS. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the presentation. You can shut this machine down, but good job, guys. I just booted up. <laughs> Okay, so we we did that again. This is another uh, version of BIOS, and you can change things like the uh, multiplier, the clock speeds, all sorts of stuff. That um, what's that? Was that an ASUS file? Yeah, the Extreme Tweaker. I think that is an ASUS BIOS. Um, Phoenix is the manufacturer of the BIOS itself, but yeah, I think this is an ASUS. So if it doesn't turn on, what are you, you going to do? Um, the, the first, <laughs> yeah, before you actually take a hammer to it, the first thing you want to do is just make sure all your connections um, are plugged in properly. Everything has power. Um, sometimes if you have a speaker on your motherboard, your computer will actually output a beep code, and that can be used to diagnose what's, what's gone wrong. Um, and you can look in your motherboard manual for, for those instructions. If you think something's failed, go ahead and try to swap parts. If you have access to another machine or like a French machine, you know, swap the part that you think has gone bad. Try to boot the computer. If it works, then you know it. something's gone wrong with that. If you have everything up and running, I would recommend running a stress test. And that's basically going to max out your CPU. Um, it can test the memory. It can test the graphics. Um, just to make sure that your computer is stable and that everything's running over the long term. Question. It's also used for burning in the thermal fluid too. Right? That is a good point. Um, in order to you know create the best possible connection, you can do what's called a burn-in. Leave your computer running overnight. It'll create really high temperatures, 
but after that you should be set. You should have a real good connection between the heatsink and the processor itself. Um, the one that we use at the desk is called Pi95. It calculates pi out to like millions of digits. It's kind of cool. So while you're doing that, I always try to run a monitoring software um, like PC Wizard or CPUZ, um, CPUZ. And you'll be able to actually monitor the temps. So you can see uh, the processor temperatures, um, graphics processor temperatures, hard drive temperatures, <coughs> all sorts of information. So these are some useful tools. Um, the fan speed as well. Um, once everything's running, basically, uh, this is kind of out of order, I guess, but software, go ahead and install your operating system, um, Windows 7. I think Mark actually threw uh, OS X onto his home built PC, so I wouldn't recommend it if you, if you really need it. But, um, Ubuntu is free, obviously. Go ahead and install the drivers that came with your motherboard. Um, usually it's just on a disk, so I guess you do need the disk drive. Um, just put it in. I mean, you can do a USB transfer, but um, that'll have things for your network, your chipset, audio, and then also your video card drivers. Go ahead and grab your applications, office, browsers. <laughs> you know, the means by which you're for acquiring all of their applications. <laughs> and then get an antivirus if you're uh, worried about that kind of stuff. Um, that's about it. Just a couple more links. Uh, Newegg, obviously. Tiger Direct is another good place to buy hardware online. And then uh, some two sites for uh, component reviews to do like the benchmark tests and stuff like that. Tom's Hardware and Arm Tech. So that's about all I had prepared. Do you guys have any questions? Um, things along those lines. Danny? I've got my computer here in case people want to see like the newer stuff. Like I can go back and show them. SATA connections and stuff like that. I think that's a good, why don't we crowd around Yay's computer in an orderly fashion? Because um, it was actually fairly recently. You, you can take it away. Sorry? <coughs> so, first thing to look at is the hard drives. They have these really thin, like, red cables that are easy to plug in and out. That's the SATA. Um, instead of the long red and IDE ones. Um, this is the data that you plug it into like your motherboard and this is the power that comes out of your power supply. Um, this is a newer video card. It plugs into the PCI Express thing. They look like this. They're not brown like the AGP. They're kind of whatever color. Like mine is blue. Yeah, I think blue is pretty common. Yeah, blue is usually where you want to put it. Um, I have a really big heat sink. The sound card just plugged into like a, one of these basic PCI slots. And my motherboard power connection is four pins bigger than the ones on the old computers. So this is pretty much what a computer is going to look like if you build it today. I mean, depending on the case. If you have something wrong with that, you can Yeah, this power supply is it. Oh. It was 80 plus two. Yes. Uh, if only it worked for you. So it's not a bad car. So that's also one that came with this case. Yep, they're not always bad. But I think we diagnosed that by swapping parts, right? Yep. You use one I swapped for one of these power supplies, and it turned on. So that was a power supply. All right. Well, good deal. Any other questions? Um, yeah. So I've heard something, and I don't know what exactly, like, I can't articulate it perfectly, but I'll say like the gist of it and see if you like know what I'm talking about. So basically someone's like, yeah, the processing power that you have is supposed to be proportional to something with the front side bus, which is supposed to be proportional with something to the ramp. Like there's some like, huh? Bottleneck? It's a bottleneck problem. So a bottleneck refers to, um, a constraint on the system. Like if you have two components that are really high functioning and then one component that serves as an intermediary, then that's going to be a, a bottleneck. It's going to slow everything else down. So the FSB speed advertised on your motherboard, um, the front side bus, it's going to act as an intermediary between your processor and the memory and the other components. So you want to make sure that those match up um, generally. It, it gets a little bit more complicated. But, uh, you can usually change settings for that in your motherboard. Um, obviously, the processor is not going to change for a front side bus, but you can change the RAM speeds. 
and get certain ratios that are supposed to be faster or slower. Yeah, you don't really need to worry about it. As long as like you know the parts will work together out of the box, like you never have to really swap that stuff. It's more of like an overclocking or extreme performance. Mm -hmm. kind of thing.